San Diego, who will tell us about algorithms for detecting selection. OK, uh, thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful meeting. I think it's been, the talks have been particularly insightful, uh, especially for someone like me who's more an outsider to the community. So uh, I think we are fortunate to be in this era where we can see uh, evolution at work. And my own interest in the field started when some collaborators of mine uh, talked about some of the experiments they were doing. And I'll take two examples to show uh, sort of the diversity of examples that we can now deal with. So in the first case, they had this uh, very nice fly model where uh, they took a progenitor population and asked what, it would, what would happen if uh, we reduce the oxygen in the chamber. So, so they split it up into two parts. Uh, one was a control, and the other they gradually evolved under sort of lower and lower oxygen till they reached 4% um, oxygen. So, so that's significantly lower. I think if you want a kind of uh, uh, you know a different view of how low that might be, uh, it's the oxygen you would see if you were 12,000 feet above Everest. So, so at this point, you know most humans would be uh, uh, you know pretty much not able to breathe and die. And it took the flies also many generations to adapt. Uh, uh, and uh, after uh, about 40 or 50 generations, a line was established where you could see that there was some inherited change uh, because you can put them for a few generations in normal oxygen and then put them back in hypoxia and they do just fine. So, so certainly the change is genetic. And the question was that if we sequenced uh, the entire genomes of these flies, and in this case, they did not do it for individuals because you have to sort of amplify the DNA, but they just pulled together population and sequenced them, again, in triplicate in both the controls and normals. And they asked us if there's regions uh, where you can see that there was some selective constraint being applied. So that, it was a very nice model with a lot of controls, and uh, we were excited to work on it. Okay. Uh, second example. Uh, oh, sorry, just to say one more thing about the flies. You know, the breeding cycle's about two weeks, so... <laughs> 180 generations, uh, which is where the fly was when they first sequenced it, would take us uh, quite a ways back in human history. Of course, you know, the evolution rates and uh, all are not the same, so it's not a direct comparison. Uh, and the other thing is that the uh, flies, in spite of being very distant, do have homology with human proteins. And I think the second example will, will uh, tell, take us to a place where we can actually use some of this information. So. Uh, this is uh, the second example about, is about humans living in sort of hypoxic conditions up in, the, uh, in high altitudes. Uh, this particular place is not where we sampled the data from. It's just a place that my uh, student who did most of the work happened to visit. And so he, he put up his own pictures. This is, these are salt fields in Bolivia. And you can see him uh, sort of trying to make a pile of salt, being young and uh, I would say foolish, as he told, it, told me and then very soon falling uh, sick with uh, acute mountain sickness. And, and he had, it took him a couple of days to recover. And of course, the way he coped uh, was by increasing uh, the red blood count uh, in his cells so that he would have enough oxygen. And this is a good short-term coping mechanism, but it's really bad if this is the way uh, that humans were to cope. Because if you, if you have this not for days, but for years, then of course your blood is more viscous and your uh, <coughs> you have a whole bunch of problems uh, associated with the cardiovascular system. So clearly, uh, when you think about humans living at high altitudes, uh, and there are many studies now, uh, uh, many of them actually don't present any sort of sickness. They're normal individuals, so they must be coping in different ways. Right. Uh, so the three, there are three sort of populations that have been extensively studied, including by uh, some people in this room, uh, the Andean Mountains, uh, Tibetans and the Ethiopians, but there are a few others. Uh, and there's been a lot of work uh, done uh, recently trying to identify genes that might be uh, helpful in these uh, in, uh, in, d in determining the tolerance to these conditions. Right. So uh, the one thing we have to remember, though, is that these populations are not adapting in in uh, in the same way. And this is not only clear from, from the genetics that many of these people have done, but also just by looking at gross phenotypes. And this, this is particularly relevant to us for chronic mountain sickness. So you can see out here hemoglobin levels. 
And on the left side, you see these plots. Uh, this is sea level in the US, and it bunches together very nicely with Ethiopian and Tibetan highlanders. So if you were to sample their blood, the uh, hemocrit count would be very similar to lowlanders. But if you look at the Andean populations, it's not the case. And indeed, it is a fact that uh, in a subset of the Andean populations, at least, there is chronic mountain sickness. So certainly, this is another good model where we could try uh, and talk about this. Now, in this talk, because this is a more methods-based paper, I'll talk uh, more about algorithms. And we will res return to some of the results from both of these data sets. But just to uh, hint at what kind of work, uh, uh, what, what sort of the downstream relation of our work. OK, and I, I, should, I should add a disclaimer when I talk about algorithms, because this is an extens extensively studied field. And as you know, Dr. Slatkin put it today, many people in the audience have done sort of seminal work in this. So it was indeed with some trepidation. When we looked at the data first, well, we said, let's apply all the different uh, methods that are out there. And uh, it wasn't clear that we had something new to contribute. But one of the things that uh, was bothersome is that all of these methods, they work very differently in different regimes. And when you look at all of these different uh, publications, people usually apply a bunch of methods. And as long as you meet the cutoff in one of these methods, uh, yeah, you should be fine. So there is there's certainly some room to understand why these methods work differently in different regimes. And I think that's, that's where I'd like to start. And again, uh, I'm going to start with some things that are very, very basic, but just so that we are all on the same page. So we assume, let's say we have a simple right Fisher-like model of constant population. Uh, and every individual uh, sort of just uh, takes a parent at random from the previous generation. And then we also have used the infinite sites model. So if there's a mutation, it is, uh, it is carried on into the existing generation. Uh, unless, of course, uh, it gets eliminated or, or gets fixed in the population. So of course, we don't see the entire genealogy, only uh, the matrix at the end, which you can think of as a binary matrix for now. And then under selection, uh, uh, it's the same process, except that when the selective constraint hits, if there's a beneficial mutation indicated by star, then certainly that will expand in frequency, and it'll do that very rapidly. So the time to fixations may be like two n generations, but under fixation, it becomes more like log and generations, uh, you know, scaled by the selection parameter. So, so very quick time to fixation, and and as a result, the population all looks alike, and uh, and it has many properties. So, if you throw away the uh, the genealogy, uh, the lineages that died out, and just look at the genealogy, clearly there is a difference, and that difference is the basis for most of the algorithms you can have. You can think in terms of long haplotypes created by this ancestral branch length. Uh, the loss of diversity, and so on. Right. So, so really, that's, that's the uh, framework in which our own work lies. And uh, let's just talk about, uh, let's start with the allele frequency spectrum, although I, I'll have something to say about the haplotypes as well. So if you take uh, this data set, and you can think of the rows as individuals and uh, sites as locations with, let's say, zero representing the ancestral mutation and one representing the mutant allele and just look at the frequencies of different spots and then compute a histogram of the frequencies, the so-called site frequency spectrum. It looks something like this. Now, the nice thing is that if you scale, if you take these numbers and actually scale them by the frequency, so you multiply the frequencies, then the plot looks a lot more uniform. Okay? And, and this is really a remarkable result, a uh, classical result in the field due to Fu, which simply says that if you take uh, the, uh, the, the site frequency spectrum, and you scale it by the frequency, then in the expectation, it's, it's the scale mutation rate. All right. So let's start with this plot. It's, uh, it's fairly simple to understand. And now let's think about the same thing in terms of uh, selection. So imagine that you have some time scale, and you were to sample individuals at different times. Certainly, if it was a neutral population, nothing would change in the site frequency spectrum. But let's say that at time zero is when the selection pressure starts, right? So, so now we have a red plot which shows the allele frequency spectrum uh, at different times. And even at a time very close to the times in selection, you can see that there's a significant difference in the allele. This is averaged over many samples, of course. Uh, near fixation, you see a very strong divergence between the blue plot and the, allele, the scale allele frequency spectrum. Uh, under selection, and this is clearly where 
most of the methods seem to work very well. And then over time, uh, the plot shifts, and then maybe 10,000 generations, as Dr. Slepkin put in, these, these plots probably merge, and, and then the signal's kind of lost, at least in the allele frequency stage. Now, why is the plot like this? I think it's very easy to understand if you look at it this way. There's a long branch, uh, sorry, there's a long branch which gives you a whole bunch of high frequency SNPs, and then there's very quick explosion, so you have a lot of uh, mutations at very low frequencies, and there's a depletion in the intermediate frequency. Right? And so if you think about uh, tests of selection, they're really trying to find uh, the difference between these two curves. And there's sort of uh, two scenarios in which people work on them. They're the so-called cross-population tests, where you have two populations, one evolving neutrally and the other under uh, some kind of non-neutrality or selection. And you just try to find uh, some way of differentiating between these two curves. And then there's the single population kind of test, uh, where you just look at this population and see if the curve is different from expected. And a very uh, you know, large number of tests just do different statistics. That is, they take two different uh, estimates of this. Now, one of the things that is obvious from Fu's result is that since each of these values is an estimate of theta, any linear combination is also an estimate. So if you take two different linear combinations and you subtract them, uh, you, in expectation they would be zero, but by choosing the weights carefully, you can get uh, a value that sort of says that you're in selection. And the, this is uh, an observation that Acha has made that all of the different <coughs> tests, really the way to think about them is by looking at the different weights that you give them. And so the weight for uh, something like Tajima's D would be like this, uh, as shown here whereas Fei and Wu's H would be as shown over there. So now, what, what's the thing out here? This gives us a framework for understanding when a particular algorithm is going to work well, because you can already see that if you have uh, weights like this and weights like this, they won't always give uh, similar values, especially if you look, sort of go back, and you look at the data here, uh, in the early part, near fixation, because Tajima's D gives a very strong negative value to the low frequency guys and very small negative value to the high frequency ones, it'll have a very strong negative signal here. Not so much for Fu, which equally weights uh, this one negatively and this one positively. Whereas if you go out here, you can see that uh, Tajima's D will not do as well anymore because there's a strong negative component here, nothing here, whereas Fei and Wu's uh, statistic will do much better. All right, so, so it gives us a framework to understand uh, how these results would perform. And it's, uh, if you do some simulations, you can see the trend pretty much shows up. So these are all different plots under uh, different selection constraints. Here's the times in selection, and the dotted line gives the fixation. The fixation time, of course, also depends on N and S. It's roughly logarithm of N uh, to scale by S, so something like that. So, so you can see out here that Fade and Woods does much better in the post-selection regime, whereas uh, Tajima's D does well in the uh, early selection regime. All right, so, yes, question? And the region of uh, recognition, do you get these results? And what is the size of the regions you use? So I, I don't have the numbers offhand, but we use, what, what we do is, we do a trick that everybody does because in, in forward simulation, so rather than taking N as 10,000, we take N as 1,000, and then we scale the mutation and recombination rates I don't have the numbers offhand, but I can, uh, I can dig them up and, and find out. But it shows numbers that are uh, sort of you know, standard in the literature. I just don't remember them. Okay. Now, just to sort of get to the punchline, you know, we can do better. But the idea is very simple. Once you understand that uh, you have these uh, weights, and there's a specific regime of weights that will work well in different situations, well, the question you might ask is, why not just train the weights that are appropriate for a specific model. So if, if you were lucky and you knew what the selective constraint was S and what the time since selection was, uh, then we could just sort of create training data sets where we have uh, these uh, spectral uh, frequency spectra from uh, regions under selection and under neutral evolution, and then just try to figure out what the optimum weights were. And of course, there are many, many techniques uh, we just used a very simple technique, but in this, you can think of all of these um, frequency vectors as points in high-dimensional space, and then the weights uh, just define a hyperplane, 
And the goal is to find a hyperplane that best separates these points. So we used support vector machines, but we also tried many other techniques. And interestingly, they all seem to give very similar results of the data that we have. So, so in this case, you know, when we try this, of course, you know, we have a, a different data set trained for every specific regime. Uh, we end up sort of dominating the spectrum. And you can see that, indeed, there is a decay in power. But the power to select is much, much better uh, than what we could have. Now, of course, we are cheating because we have access to all of these, um, the scale coefficients and also the times and selection. What if we didn't have that? So we, uh, there are, of course, other direct ways of estimating, but we went with something very simple. We said, let's look at the weights that we have learned and try to see if there's some relationship between the weights. So, uh, what we can do is, uh, on this plot, what we do is, let's take a specific uh, selection coefficient. These are sort of all the uh, weights learned for different times in selection, and we compare the weights learned against themselves. And if you look at the scale, you can see that the set of weights uh, fall very nicely into two blocks, uh, one sort of in the post-fixation regime and one in the near-fixation. In the pre very early stages, there's very little signal. So that looks very nice because it suggests that we don't need these you know, uh, very, very large number of models. We could do with uh, very few, uh, a few number of models. And when you apply this to different uh, set of selection pressures and different selection times, the whole uh, structure is completely maintained. You can see that the time to fixation is shifting as you go from uh, very high selection coefficients to very low selection coefficients, but still the post-selection and the pre-selection and the near-selection regimes remain fixed. It suggests that a relatively small number of models can still explain, uh, explain this data. All right, so we did something very simple, almost sort of uh, first principles. We just took two, we took, collected all of our data sets and trained something for near fixation, and then we collected the data sets for post-fixation, and we trained them, and our statistic was simply the maximum of the discrimination for either of them. And that, again, turns out to do quite well. It sort of beats uh, other methods, but it also gives us a framework in which we can now, if we want, uh, say, in the post-selection, we have a lot of room for improvement. It tells us some directions in which we can go. Right? Now, we can also do this for cross-population uh, tests. And uh, in this case, we have, say, if you have a matched population, certainly we had that in the fly case. But often in human cases, people do look at some neighboring population. And we'll, instead of looking at just the allele frequency spectrum, we can look sort of at two-dimensional allele frequency spectrum. So you take the same uh, uh, site in two locations and compute the joint distribution of their frequencies and, and then the, uh, and the spectrum out of that. And now if you uh, have this analogous version of the scaled uh, site frequency for pairs of uh, frequencies, you can learn pretty much the same uh, uh, vector weights and, and try to discriminate between selection and non-selection. Right? And again, uh, we tried this approach, and it does well, both in the sort of specific case where we, of course, quickly dominate everything else, but also in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the case where we only train two models. And now we compare against other cross-population tests, uh, the EHHs, uh, uh, an extension of the homozygote, uh, extended homozygote, has, uh, uh, it has to do with the haplotype, length of haplotype, sorry, and then the composite likelihood uh, test due to uh, Nick Patterson and David Reich. So, so certainly there is, uh, uh, I think we can summarize and say <coughs> that while there's still room for improvement in the test, it does look like there's a fair amount of work that you can do with very simple uh, vectors just based on looking at allele frequencies and so on. Okay. So the question that we asked uh, ourselves uh, next was, well, you know, there are many other selection regimes. There are also different demographic scenarios, but I'm going to skip that for now. Uh, there's so-called uh, multi-locus selection where you have a lot of alleles at different locations, uh, which jointly uh, might confer, confer selective advantage, and that becomes much harder, and I won't have much to say about it today. But I want to say a few words about uh, soft sweep, and this is sort of more unpublished work uh, out here, right? So, so consider a situation where 
the beneficial allele was already exist, extent in the population when, when selection happened. So this is the so-called a hard sweep case where the beneficial allele uh, is uh, at very low frequencies when the selective constraint appeared. And here we can see a quick exponential growth uh, in, in alleles carrying this beneficial allele. Now here, in the soft selection, we have a different scenario because the uh, beneficial allele was already existing in the population. And so it was sort of the haplotypes carrying this allele were drifting around and there's a fair amount of variation that they may have inherited. And then once selected pressures uh, occurred, they sort of grew exponentially, but they compete with each other because they are more or less equally fit. Uh, and then they outcompete uh, uh, other clades and my other lineages that might uh, not, not carry the beneficial allele. Right? So the signal, therefore, is, is somewhat muted, and, and we would still like to be able to detect it. Right? So now we have this additional parameter <laughs> f, which is the frequency of, of the beneficial allele at the time of selection. Right? So uh, to, in order to handle these cases, we sort of go back to the literature and look at uh, haplotype-based tests. Uh, if you think about hard sweeps, people often look for a dominant haplotype. And, and this is often represented by this ancestral branch here. And so if you can capture this, uh, there's, fairly, there's not enough mutations here. So this diversity is maintained. And many of these tests, like IHS, try to capture this. Uh, and if you look at neutral populations, there's a fair amount of diversity. So you won't see a single haplotype sort of sweeping the surface. Now, this is, we cannot really expect the same thing in soft selection. Uh, so uh, one might consider the haplotype frequency spectrum. And indeed, there's a recent paper from the Petrov lab, which instead of taking the dominant haplotype, takes the top two dominant haplotypes. And they come up with a statistic that seems to do well in these circumstances. Right? So we asked this question, well, how can we improve uh, the, or how can we predict uh, a shift in the haplotype frequency spectrum relative to the neutral uh, allele. So uh, <clears throat> what, would, what you want to do in order to sort of strengthen the signal is to be able to eliminate these recent polymorphisms because they kind of add noise. If you could eliminate them, then you get uh, a, a, a stronger shift in the haplotype frequency because only the dominant haplotypes remain. All of these guys become identical out here. So if you could somehow eliminate these SNFs without necessarily eliminating the low frequency SNPs in the neutrally evolving population, uh, that should strengthen the result. It should make the shift more pronounced. And this is the problem that we sort of grappled with a little bit. Uh, now, there, again, with all of these things, there are many ways to approach this. You might uh, consider just sort of building the uh, you know, approximations to the coalescent and actually figuring out which uh, mutations are the early ones sort of lie ahead, where the haplotypes are. Or you might try to do something like IHS, which just looks, starts from a particular location and then just looks at the decay in the haplotype uh, frequency and, and use that as a statistic. Uh, what we do is uh, we want to try and eliminate these low frequency guys so that the high frequency ones automatically eliminate. So, so we come up with this sort of fancy sound sounding title, but really it's something very simple. So you take, you start with any node, and you give it uh, the weight of the subtree at that node, and then the node here has the weight of the subtree at that node, and so on till you go down to the haplotype, right? And then the CFP of this haplotype is just the two norm of that vector. Now that vector will look very different for uh, things that are under hard sweep, soft sweep, and neutrally evolving. Here you can see that there are a lot of medium frequency guys, so the CFP value will be somewhat mid, uh, in the middle. Here you'll have very high CFP values. Sorry, here you'll have very high CFP values because all of these uh, nodes have the entire subtree uh, as, as uh, their sub, uh, have the entire tree as their subtree, right? So, so the CFP can help distinguish between uh, mutations that are uh, at the bottom uh, uh, without eliminating the mutations that might be under neutral selection. And so now we have these two uh, facets. We have the frequency of the allele itself, and we have its CFP. By the way, the CFP of a variant would be just the average of the CFP of all the haplotypes uh, carrying that vector. All right. So, so uh, 
here's sort of just a plot of a single example, though you know we, we can see similar results with expected uh, with expectations over many samples. Here in the middle, the plus uh, symbols are where the neutrally evolving alleles lie. So they have mid medium values of CFPs and medium values of frequencies. But for uh, something under selection, and this is with uh, a, a soft selection scenario where the initial frequency was about 0.3, the situation is quite different. So in the beginning, they all look matched up with the neutral alleles. And now uh, the alleles begin to shift. And so you will see uh, a lot of SNPs that carry on with the beneficial allele in star, and that's sort of moving on towards high frequency and high CFP values, and they go all the way to the top right and sort of disappear. And then the early SNPs, they have this other property that they have high CFP values but low frequencies, and so they keep moving in the top quadrant uh, till the time where the uh, beneficial allele disappears and now suddenly they will shift uh, because we no longer have them here. So they, they'll shift to having low CFP values because the, the nodes carrying the high uh, subtrees have disappeared. So if we eliminated these two quadrants, and we use uh, a, another sort of machine learning technique to find the best separators, but what I won't go into here, we can actually eliminate the recent SNPs with which it might be in the selected uh, scenarios without eliminating any of the mutations in the neutral alleles. And so if you, if you do this elimination, you end up seeing a very strong signal in the frequency spectrum. So here we have the haplotype frequency spectrum. And not surprisingly, most of the haplotypes have very low frequencies. And there's very little distinction between something evolving neutrally and something under sweep. Uh, even if you go from 100 generations to 50, 500, 1,000 generations, or so different generations. If you apply a filter just based on frequencies, you begin to see some difference. And now if you apply a, uh, 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 a filter based on both frequencies and CFPs, you see you begin to see a very, very strong difference in these selections. Right? So it's a way of getting at the haplotypes uh, that are core to the, to, the, uh, to the selection without actually having to compute the coalescent itself. All right, and not surprisingly, we also have uh, good power, it's not as good as in the hard sweep case, uh, but we, have, we do have uh, good power here. For comparison, we have the IHS test and the H12, which at least in our hands didn't seem to perform that well. All right. Okay, so uh, just a uh, summary is that early results do show some promise in detecting soft sweep, but we still have a lot of work to do to be able to distinguish soft sweep scenarios from hard sweep. Currently, we were just working on seeing if we could detect uh, whether the region was under non-neutrality or not in the presence of soft sweep. Right? And the other thing that's uh, somewhat unclear, although I didn't really show uh, data for this, is that it's not clear that the haplotype frequency spectrum really is a better discriminator than site frequency spectrum, even in the soft sweep case. So even though we use that to motivate our talk, in, uh, in experimental data, it seems like the there's more signal in the side frequency spectrum, even in this, uh, even in the soft sweep scenario. All right, so uh, I want to just uh, end with some experimental data. And this is not involving the soft sweep scenario. We haven't really tried that on, on a lot of experimental data, but just the hard sweep. So in the fly case, uh, we found exactly two regions. And you can see that the signal with whole genome, and I'll have a little bit, bit more to say about this in a minute. Uh, is quite strong in a few regions. And moreover, in this case, they had replicate populations, so you have the opportunity to see whether the different uh, independently evolving populations found the same regions under selection or not. And, and it turns out that they do very nicely. Here we took the same statistic and just inverted it to show one population here and one population here. And you can see that the regions that uh, sort of go beyond our false discovery rate cutoff are exactly matched up. And in fact, even uh, elsewhere, they seem to be very nicely matched up. And then there just happen to be two regions uh, with close to 188 genes. So these are you know, largish regions with, which are gene rich, but uh, they, they seem to be having the signal for selection. What you can do in the flies, of course, is that you can do additional experiments. And in many cases, uh, we did some knockdown experiments and identified many of the genes, especially uh, genes in the notch pathway 
that, that seem to be under uh, uh, selection pressure. And with the application of the new statistic, we found very interesting results. So first, we matched up all of the results that we had uh, before, which did, uh, you know, the matchup was very good. But in addition, Notch itself, uh, which is, of course, you know, one of the key components of the Notch pathway, uh, also happens to show a sig uh, signature of selection. So that is an exciting discovery, something that we are following up in the lab now. Okay. Now, we do the same thing for the human data. But in this, in this case, we don't have a control population that's available to us. So we did look at uh, uh, a few related populations. Uh, we did a quick test uh, of, of admixture. And we find that our uh, sort of Andean populations look uh, somewhat more similar to uh, the MXL Mexicans in LA. So go figure. And, and, and we took as an outgroup an African population, which seemed to be very different in population. So we have the three clades. We, do, we also do three population tests. So we have the, uh, uh, the highlanders, the CMS and non-CMS in the highlanders, and then uh, the lowlander controls, and, and also an outgroup. Right. Now, one of the questions that people often ask is, you know, well, how many individuals did we do? We did very few individuals. It's still expensive. We only did. Uh, sort of 10 and 10 each, 10 uh, in, with CMS, 10 without CMS. And so this was really a question for us. Should we go with whole genome sequencing and sort of sample all sites or, or go with, uh, with few sites and maybe use arrays or exome sequencing or one of the uh, less expensive technologies? And I'd like to make a plug. So one of the things that you can get with whole genome sequencing is that you can get uh, you have a much, much denser spectrum of, of populations. And here's some data to show how that works out. So one of the regions that we find uh, on chromosome 19 has a very, very strong signal for us. Uh, here are the non-CMS individuals. And you can see that there's uh, a whole bunch of haplotypes at, a, at very similar frequency, frequencies, suggesting a rise in haplotype frequency here. Here we have a much uh, bigger variation. And so this, is, this gives a very nice signal. Now, if you look at the same data with genotyping, there are just too few SNPs to really make a call. And uh, it's not easy when you're talking about populations like this to do an imputation because you are really, uh, there's a selection bias and ascertainment bias in how the control populations are selected. So if you use those, the 1,000 genome, to impute populations that are in the highlanders, and we have some sort of data that's not on this talk, but I can show it to you later which suggests that imputation techniques wouldn't work in this case. So we get this. We also have similar results with exome sequencing, where there are very few uh, data sets. All right. So we applied a whole bunch of different techniques to this. And I'll just sort of zoom in on the same region that I showed on. Uh, no, this one's different. This is chromosome 12 region. This one came up with, uh, with two, uh, three genes of interest. Uh, and, and it was a sort of region under, uh, you can see that there's a very strong frequency differential, which suggests that this region might be, sorry, of interest. Don't fall off. All right, so um, uh, the genes are interesting, but they also give us another sort of perspective on how we can do these experiments, because in this case, we also collected, <laughs> our collaborators also collected uh, fibroblasts. So, so we have in potential, we can convert them to iPSCs, and they're doing that, and then convert them to pretty much any tissue type. And that allows us to measure uh, gene expression under a variety of scenarios. But, but the data here is just for fibroblasts. And once you take these sort of uh, cell lines and now you uh, put them under hypoxia, you do see reduced expression of certain genes, uh, of these two genes, not, not the third one. And that suggests that a lowered expression <coughs> which is consistent with, with our sort of genetic data is, is indeed important for, for hypoxia tolerance. Now you can take the same genes and you can take their homologs and knock them down in Drosophila where we have a lot of RNAi intermediates. And certainly uh, if you put them in normal oxygen, they seem to have regular expression patterns, uh, uh, but, but uh, I mean, sorry, they have to seem to have high survival rates, but under hypoxia, when these genes are interfered with and their expression is reduced, the survival is greatly enhanced, whereas when the knockdown isn't there and the genes are active, then the survival is low. So we can go sort of all the way from our predictions to experiment in this particular situation. 
All right, so uh, I'd like to sort of just conclude here by saying that uh, indeed uh, whole genome sequences are useful when you're identifying signatures of selection. The density of data that you get is, is very important for the algorithms to work. That there is still room for algorithmic improvement, as I showed in the first part of my talk. And now with sort of newer techniques, there is, uh, we have the potential to go all the way from our predictions down to the uh, to experiments in the lab. So it's, it's good news all around. All right. And just to acknowledge, Roy and Nitin are the grad students in my lab who did pretty much all of the work. And of course, this is a big collaborative project, so Gabby Haddad was our main collaborator, and he and Dan Zhao in his lab did all of the experimental work that, that I'm showing here. The, the work on selection was in collaboration with Iran, who's in, in the audience, and the work on soft sweeps is in collaboration with Noah Rosenberg at Stanford. All right, thank you all. Hey, any questions? Yeah. Have you estimated the sensitivity of your methods to background selection? To background selection? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know. What does that mean, background selection? Um, it's when you have a deleterious allele that increases a bit in frequency, but then disappears and takes away haplotypes with it. Uh -huh. It also skews the um, side frequency spectrum. I have, we have not uh, tested in that particular scenario. It's a good question. Maybe we can talk offline. Uh, you said that there wasn't really any more uh, information in the haplotype spectrum than in the uh, allele frequency spectrum. I mean, it, it seems hard to believe that, you know, because there, there's, there, there's a ton more information that you're saying it's not, there's not more useful information there. Right. Yeah, of course, I mean, some of it is, you know, how, what our experiments reveal, but I mean, in general, yes, there is, when you use haplotypes, but you have to remember that if you have, it's somewhat data dependent too. If you take a much larger spectrum of haplotypes, you might be able to get finer differences in haplotype frequencies. But the other thing is that you have to do a very careful job. As, as, the, uh, you know, as the evolution happens, even rare variants will change haplotypes. So what does it mean for two haplotypes to be identical or very similar to each other? We use the specific filtering technique to filter out the haplotypes. But in our hands, once you do that, the allele frequency spectrum does as good a job better job of discriminating than the haplotype frequency spectrum. But that's not to say that, you know, everything that we could say uh, has been, I mean, everything that one could say has been said. Yeah. Uh, you saw some other hands. Yes. Um, so a little frequency spectra is influenced by variable population size. And I was wondering if you looked at that, how... Yes, we, we did do uh, a test under a bunch of demographic scenarios. I don't know, let me see if I have a slide. Uh, oh yeah, this is one of the ones that we did. Uh, so it's just, you know, to take a, a term, it's a, a truthful kind of experiment where there's a bottleneck and, and the sort of, uh, there's the African and the European population. We also tried a bunch of other scenarios. I think the results are more or less uh, similar to what we have before in the sense that, remember, we have one series of tests that are really specific to the data set train. And so if you take uh, a population sample training data from this and you train them, you'll get excellent results. And then if you take a more generic model and you apply them, you still get good results, but with reduced power. So, so the story doesn't change, but we did try a few days. The, the problem, though, is that you don't know which one to uh, apply except in cases where you know something about the demographics and you're confident applying a specific model. Okay, so... Thanks again. Okay.